Welcome to the Open Mic Podcast Show with Mike Midgley. Hey, and welcome to the Open Mic Podcast. And in today's episode, we're going to be discussing a topic about brand development and strategy and its critical importance and how it really represents your organization. In today's fast-paced transactional purchasing environment, where a lot of people out there, uh, you know, especially developers, are out to do just a single piece of collateral and say, hey, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, or something like that, it really amazes me how uh, so many entrepreneurs overlook the need to fully undertake a brand's uh, analysis and give their identity the true attention that it deserves. So the value of a well-executed brand strategy will repay dividends. You know, when I've worked in the stock market businesses, you know, businesses are worth at least 10 plus percent more just by having a quality executable brand and many times more for the, you know, the really, you know, super global brands. So brand, brand, brand is where it's at. And having that well-executed brand strategy, as I said, will repay lots and lots and lots of dividends time and time over. Um, So it's culture, it's course, the marketing collateral you produce, Everything about it, even how you recruit staff to your business is all about that brand identity. I mean, who wants to work for a bad brand? So in this episode, I'm extremely excited uh, and nervous to a degree because brand's so close to my heart to have one of what I'd call the USA's leading brand consultants um, on the Open Mic podcast, uh, a major player in brand development and strategy. He's worked with global rock stars, with people like John Bon Jovi, international digital, uh, uh, again, gurus like Russell Brunson, um, and many, many, many more. So welcome to the show, the founder and CEO, CEO of Unique Designs uh, in New York, the brand doctor himself, Henry Kaminsky Jr. How are you today, Henry? Mike, it, I'm excited to be here. I appreciate you bringing me on and uh, excited to uh, chat with your audience. Oh, that's brilliant. I really appreciate your enthusiasm this morning. Because what time is it over in New York at the moment? Just about 10 past quarter past nine, something like that. It's bright and early. I'm ready to roll. Absolutely. So we've got you at your best. So that's great. And for the UK listeners, as well as our international listeners, you know, you really want to check Henry out. Uh, If you want to search The Brand Doctor, he also runs a podcast as well. And we'll be sharing his website and Facebook and and, and other sort of areas that you can sort of connect with uh, Henry later on through the show. But uh, Henry's pedigree is without question up there with the very, very best not just a full service graphic design branding and marketing agency. He's overcome the odds to be a wildly successful entrepreneur, multi-million dollar uh, businesses over the past decade. Um, He's also an Amazon bestselling author. So please check him out and get that book purchased called Refuse to Give Up uh, on Amazon. Um, As I mentioned earlier, he's also the podcast host, um, the Brand Doctors podcast, where he talks about strategies to help entrepreneurs design reputable and profitable personal brands. So, I know that's just a touch on such a little part, Henry, of what you've actually done in your own words. I mean, I've watched the YouTube video. And by the way, guys, if you do nothing else, even if you tune out of this podcast right now, you go over and you search the brand doctor and Henry Kaminsky Jr. on YouTube and you watch Henry's introductory. If you want motivation, you want the achievement, you want de- burning desire uh, and ultimate success. The, I think it's about eight minute video on there. It's absolutely phenomenal. So uh, please go over and watch that. So Henry, I've, I've sort of covered the touches points, but I'd love you in your own words to help the audience understand a little bit more about this crazy roller coaster ride that you've been on for the last 10 or 12 years. <laughs> well, you're making me blush, Mike. I don't <laughs> <tell> you. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this nice and tight for you guys. So when I graduated college, I went into the corporate world right out of college and I started working at a, a local hospital and I, I, I started at the very, very bottom. I was cleaning coffee pots for half the day and checking insurances. And that's where I started my professional career. And I was always a go-getter. And I always like to tell this story up front because it's, it really has... Um, pointed me in the direction and really solidified my entrepreneurial spirit from the very, very beginning. So when I was eight years old, uh, my parents signed me up for a, a, a local soccer team and I hated it. <laughs> like I, I was this little chubby fat kid when I was little and I hated exercise. I hated sports. I wanted nothing to do with it. So I think they just signed me up to just kind of keep me healthy and in shape. But so I would, I, would go to the, I would go to the practices and go to the games and I really just wasn't into it. And it was ironic because that year, our team makes it to the championship oh. game, right? <laughs> so we were actually pretty good. And I'll never forget it. Uh, we were in the championship game. There's about 400 people there. And 
I wish you were there, Mike. Yeah. Every time the ball would get to one side of the field, my chubby little butt would be on the opposite side. Oh no! And it was and it was like a cap. It was like a cat and mouse game. Every time I would get to the other side of the field, guess where the ball would be? The other side. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 that was the the majority of the game. And I remember, uh, like it was yesterday, Mike ready to walk off the field yeah. like all right this is okay. enough i've had it yeah. and i remember looking over to my right and out of the sea of people that were on the side of the 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 field only one person stood out yeah. and it was my dad yeah and i just remember him clear as day screaming and pointing off the top of his lungs get the ball, keep going, get the ball. And something just came over me at yeah. eight years old that I can't explain. And I ran like hell, like a, like a psychopath after this ball, taking out everything and everyone that was in front of me. I wind up catching up to the ball, dribbling it down the field and freaking scoring <laughs> my first and only goal of the season. And it just like took the game. It just, it, and, and, and that sounds, it sounds so Hollywood, right? But, but, but it's, but it was, but it was that moment. It's like that tipping point, isn't it? It was that tipping point. And that's where I got this never give up attitude and mentality. Yeah. And to this day, I, 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 I thank my dad for that moment. And my dad, my dad raised me as a single, as a single father. Um, I didn't have quite the relationship with my mother when I was growing up. And so uh, watching him work for jobs, watching him put food on the table and his work ethic and really never giving up on me. Yeah. And providing. Has been a great, great experience. And now that I have my one-year-old son, uh, it, it, it just, my mission and my purpose in life is to show him how to design a life Perfect. on his terms. Yeah. And, and so that's where we, so that's, that's the, that's the story of, of the entrepreneurial spirit. And so let's get back into the professional career. So absolutely. I spent eight years at the hospital and wasn't a huge fan of my position. So <laughs> I always wanted to level up my game. And so at 23 years old, I went back to school, got my master's degree in business wow. management. And I fell into a huge pitfall because nobody wanted to hire me because I was a 23 year old with a master's degree that didn't have any experience. Yeah, so you, you suffer, you, you go back to try and better yourself, but then you, get, you find other obstacles come in the way to sort of say, hey, you know, this guy's right. never done it. Right. So what I did was I applied because I was aggressive and I still am. <laughs> I applied for every management and director position that I saw come out on the board and at one rejection after the other, boom, 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 boom. And then finally I get an opportunity in the children's hospital yeah. as a sudden infant death syndrome center director of events. Yeah. And this was a very, oh, it was a rewarding position, but a very sad position. So for those folks that don't know what SIDS is, sudden infant death syndrome is when a, a baby under the age of one years old dies suddenly and unexpectedly without any cause. Yeah. And so it was, it was, it was a rewarding position because I was able to create and market events that would raise money yeah. for all the families in the state of New Jersey who had lost the baby to SIDS. Yeah. And then I was able to use those funds and spend those funds on events to help the families come together and yeah, support absolutely. each other. So it's a community and it's, it's, it's all rehabilitation and coming to terms with and things like that. Absolutely. So I was able to land that position and I got my feet wet in marketing and, and event production and uh, fundraising. And it was a great position. And I got my first break. I was literally cold turkey, cold turkey emailing people looking for sponsors. Yeah. And I reached out to Z100, one of the biggest radio stations in the country in New York. And I had Danielle Monero, part of the morning show, wow. uh, reply back and said, I would love to support you on this event. So she came on board. We planned the event. She, did, she, was, she played such a pivotal role in, in getting the word out. But at the same time, Mike, I needed marketing materials and posters and flyers. And, of course, and to, support the, to support the push, yeah. 
Right. So I had no idea what graphic design was at the time, but my buddy, uh, Jerry, who was a graphic designer and a nightclub promoter who actually helped set up the venue and all that, donated his time and helped me design the flyer. So I'm sitting next to him uh, one Sunday morning and he's graphic, he's designing these flyers and I'm, I'm enamored by the, I said, wow, this is what graphic design is. So you connected with us right away. Oh my God, immediately. So uh, we did the event, it raised 20 grand. It was, a, it was a hit and now I got the creative bug. I got bit yeah, by it. Absolutely. And so I had my, I convinced my boss at the time to, pay for the Photoshop file so uh, program so I could start designing all the stuff in house, saving, saving a couple bucks, right? <laughs> <laughs> I started designing and I loved it. And I taught every, everything I know today, I, I, it was basically self-taught. I never went to school for it. And eventually other departments started to see my works and they started asking me for work. And then I started to s create this little side hustle and started working for free and just getting my feet wet outside. And I really got my break in the nightlife industry and started designing all the club flyers. Oh, yeah, which is and, obviously, yeah, yeah. and it just blew up. Right. So what happened was the hospital was doing some, some, some downsizing. There was some stuff going on there and my position started to become tighter and tighter. So what would happen was, half of the day they would pull me from that position yeah. and make me become a secretary to one of the other directors. Yeah. And I started Step to back, take, isn't it? Yeah. I started to take on this administrative role versus a director's role. And at the end of 2007, they said to me, well, listen, the first of the year, we're actually going to absorb your position completely. There's we're not going to be able to fund it anymore because part of it was funded yeah. by a grant. And you're going to become someone's secretary. And I said, so they said, you could stay or you could leave. I said, yeah, I think it's my time to go. <laughs> but, that, that, that gear shift has happened. Well, I was a nervous wreck, I'll have to say. Now, I had a, quite a bit of a business and book built up, but you're going out on your own, Mike. Like, there's, yeah. no, there's no safety net anymore. Like, the, the income from my hospital job was my safety net. And I didn't have it anymore. I didn't, have even, I didn't even have benefits, <sighs> medical benefits. So the first year, nose to the grind wheel, one man band. I did the marketing, the sales, the deliveries, because print was everything. big back then. Uh, you know, I did the more, I did everything on my own. And I was working 20, 22 hour days, getting back up, rocking out again. And I went to my accountant after the first year to do my taxes. And he says, you know, you did $248,000 in sales. I was what? like, what? <laughs> I didn't even know. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah. And, and I, that gave me the boost. That gave me the confidence to, to move you forward. So ran like hell for the first. So fast forward four years or so. And it was a, it was a very, it was a bumpy ride because I was doing something that became more of a, it became more of a job. I wasn't really liking what I was doing because yep. it's 20 hour days. And I remember walking into my office uh, my home office one day saying, is this what I'm going to be doing when I'm 50? Like yeah. 20 hour days grinding, like not seeing my, my girlfriend, now my wife, yeah. not seeing them and only going out on the weekends and working half a day weekends. And so I said, this isn't what I'm, what I signed up this for. This is what you signed up for. Yeah. Absolutely. No. And so, you know, I started to really self-sabotage. Yeah. I started to hate all of my clients. Right. I wasn't getting paid what I was worth. Yeah. And there were so many things that were, that were happening to me. And I started to become very, very uh, cynical and I really? became nasty mm -hmm. and it wasn't my client's fault. It was me, you know? And so I started to lose clients that way. Right. Yeah. Nobody wanted to work with me because I started to become a, you know, a real pain in the butt. Pain I wasn't a pleasure. <laughs> so now to top it all off, as things were starting to downslide, Hurricane Sandy comes through my neighborhood and wipes out two of my biggest clients that brought in about a quarter of a million dollars of business. And when they reorganized and restructured, they came to me and said, I apologize, Henry, but we restructured, we're bringing everything in house. We're not going to be using you anymore. Yeah. And that was a huge blow. And now I want to take you guys back because back then, see, when I was growing up, I didn't have a lot of money. I wasn't poor by any means, but we didn't have a lot of money and we, were, we lived very below the means, right? Yeah. 
And when I came into this kind of money very quickly, it went straight to my head. And I, and I always tell this story because it, it's, it happens to other people as well. I think and the so, good thing about sharing that as well, though, Henry, is that it, it reminds you of maybe some of the mistakes that you've gone down or the wrong paths, and it levels you out a bit, doesn't it? And, you know, I always remember just a quick, just a quick intro there is that as we were going up our corporate ladder, you know, and before, but even, you know, we, we, hadn't, we hadn't achieved the big exits. We'd had a couple of small exits in business. And, you know, I'm 28 years old, sticking my chest out, thinking I'm right. And then you have a bit of bad luck and you'll be surprised how many people kick you twice as hard on the way down than you go up. So I always say, you know, when you're on the way up, tread carefully and be kind. Because if you do have to come down that pole, there's a lot of people going to kick you. And I did that once and never again, you know, never again. Well, it costed me, Mike, and I'll, I'll tell you how. So uh, I let money get to me. Um, I was very materialistic. I was very pretentious. I was very selfish. Yeah. And you know, it, 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 I lost, I lost half of my family because of it, because they said, you know what? <laughs> we know you're part of the family, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have to like you. Yeah. And they sort of turned their back on me. And to this day, I only keep track of, I mean, I only keep in touch with maybe one or two family members and the rest of to this day have really just signed me off. And wow. so it, it's an experience that uh, I don't regret. Yeah. It, I, I, I designed that, not them. Okay. Yeah. And um, it, it was a price I had to pay and it was a life lesson. So as that continued to happen, my lifestyle didn't change, but my revenues and sales were going down. And I was afraid that um, to show anybody that I was, I was failing. And so yeah. kept the lifestyle to mask it. Yeah. And what happened was it got to a point where I couldn't mask it anymore because there was no money in the bank. Yeah. So I had to go to my wife and actually break the news to her to, and tell her, I basically told her that I lost my ass and I don't know what to do. And so she said, all right, I'll be right back. She jumps off the bed, goes and grabs a laptop comes back, jumps in the bed. Now I'm thinking she's ready to flip it open and start looking for divorce attorney. <laughs> and she looks me dead in the face and says, let's get to work. Brilliant. And I just, I just got emotional and, you know, I said, well, holy cow, I, 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 I not I expect it's probably what you thought was going to happen, but you didn't expect it type of thing. Listen, I said, I got lucky with this one you know, let's, let's, let's show and prove. Let's, let's, let's get this, let's get this business back on track. Right. So that's how I bumped into Russell Brunson. As I were doing research, we were looking for yeah. digital marketing strategies. So I bump into him. He's got a $25,000 program. I don't have two nickels to scratch together. And I get on the call with a salesperson and I tell him the situation and they say, you know what, the 25K is not going to be in your wheelhouse right now, but we yeah. have a 10K program right now. Would you be interested? Let me go talk to Russell. It was this whole big thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, good cop, bad cop. Right, right. And I, I just took my credit card out. I put 10 Gs on it. I said, it's not if this works, it's when this works. Yeah. And I just took a huge risk. And at that point, my risk tolerance, I knew what my risk tolerance was. And I, I, and I just said, let's roll. So never forget it. I get on the call with Russell. It was 60 minutes. We were both crying like babies because I was telling them my story and he was resonating with it. And on the spot, Mike, he hires me to help him with his first book launch. On the spot. <laughs> so that was like four or $5,000 right there. And I was like, wow, one call, I made half of my investment back with him. straight away. So hustled, did what he told me to do, really immersed myself in digital marketing, branding and all of that. Yeah. And within 18 months, I had 500K in revenue <sighs> built back up. So phenomenal, phenomenal bounce back, right? Absolutely. So <laughs> you have to go to that edge to sort of realize where you really were, because I don't ever think you understand what's, you know, you know, the, the true north of the compass is until you go to that edge, do you? That, you don't, you don't. And, and when, you're, when you're on the edge, you just have to go. You just have to go. And so he introduced me to Tony Robbins. And then I really started to work on my personal development because again, I still had that mindset. There was a lot of skeletons in that closet that I needed to, to clear them out. Yeah. So I met some people inside of the inner circle program, Russell's big coach, a high ticket coaching yeah. program. I was in that for two years, 
really, again, got, got around some, some heavy hitters. And yeah. I found this mindset coach and he helped me really rewire the way that I think and, and leave life and went to Tony Robbins event and really got some great value out of that. And just changed my outlook on life yeah. and became more grateful, became more humble, became Absolutely. more, you know, uh, blessed. And so took the business now more from a churn and burn design project based business to a eight, a small agency. I always wanted an agency. Like when yeah. I was a little, when I first started the design, a lot business, of weight, though. it was a lot of weight to carry an agency. Oh my God. And then I saw how much it was going to cost an overhead. I said, eh, maybe we'll do this digitally. Yeah. <laughs> so we, so what I did was I, I invested in developing a team and process and systems yeah. inside of my business. And I grew the agency to a 15 person team, which I still have today, which I'm, I'm so blessed to have these people working uh, under the unique designs brand because they are, they are just a bunch of incredible, motivated, creative and supportive individuals. It's like, I call it the little family yeah. and, and they're on four different continents Wow. And we have our powwow meetings every two weeks. And it's, 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 I've now created this, this online digital agency yeah. and it's just a beautiful thing. And now we work with high, higher level clients, you know, yeah. clients that are a little bit more established or if they're starting out, they, they have some capital that they invest, save and, and they're ready to go. And, um, and now we work at that level and we've become more of a, full service digital agency yeah. because we have copywriters and developers and all of that to help us with yeah, all of so that. So you can take them from launch to management and everything. Right. For, essentially from conception to completion, right? Yeah, and so, you know, I don't do everything. So, but we created a referral network. And so when you need your ads ran and managed, we have a go-to for that. And yeah. you know, it, it's been a, it's been a beautiful journey. So, um, that's not the first time I lost my ass. <laughs> it was, it, they, Russell Brunson calls it um, cycling. You cycle. And if you haven't cycled three times yet, yet you're not an entrepreneur, he said. Absolutely. <laughs> and all the greats. I mean, you know, I, over here in the UK, you look at, uh, if you may have come across things like Dragon's Den, these, these sort of investment shows, and whether you see that as a reality TV show or you see it as a, as a true sort of business lesson, either way, there's Peter Jones on there. He lost everything at 38, totally on his ass and, you know, bankrupt and, 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 and you know, and they come back and they, they, they go again. And, you know, uh, you know, even the greats and, you know, uh, you look at the Elon Musk story and you read Elon Musk story and, you know, the guy's worth, what, 21 billion or something ridiculous. And I know on the, the, the outside it looks okay, but inside I'm sure that guy's hurting sometimes at the moment. There's a lot going off over there. And, you know, I, I just saw an article, I don't know if you picked up on it, where they were saying, um, never mind the Saudis wanted to get involved with Tesla. Google or Apple should buy Tesla. And if you, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe send you that link because that's an awesome article that you maybe want to get ahead of. Um, and, but, you know, all these greats have hit the rocks, they've hit the sands, you know, and what they've done, they either choose to lay down and die or they choose to dust themselves down and like you say, what, you know, out of all the podcasts that I've done and the client meetings I've done this year, that statement that you've just given me there, Henry, is the most pleasing and when your wife says let's get to work i absolutely love that to the fact that i'm going to coin that and i'm actually going to legally steal it from you um next time i'm up against something right let's go to work and, and, <laughs> and that is awesome so what is your wife called my, what is my wife what's, yeah. what's the name of my wife tori yes. tori Cor corey no, T. T. Oh, say, Tory. Well, please thank Tory for giving me that opportunity to steal that phrase, even though I haven't asked permission, but that's awesome. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so you know, you've been up and down the roller coaster for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it was, it, so I've, uh, right now, what, what this year has taught me was we need to refine the business. Yeah. We need to distill it down. We need to create a fine wine out of the past decade yeah. and really create something special because now I have a one-year-old son that I want to spend enough, uh, you know, as much time as I can with and really- The game's changed, doesn't it? Big time, big time. So, you know, I, I said, I want to work with less people but make more money. Yeah. And how do I figure out to do that? And so um, I invested in a coach and well, two coaches, cause I was struggling with sales and I was struggling with, you know, building the brand and I needed some, 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 some mentorship really. But let me, let me step back for a second. I want to talk about the second, the second cycle I went through and, and there's a lesson here to be learned as well. So end of last year, 
we all get a client who's very trying. <laughs> and this guy slipped in and for whatever reason, it turned out to be a disaster. Now, I don't blame him. To this day, I don't blame him. I still didn't have my processes and systems yep. tuned up and refined. So you contributed to that sort of flat yep. out. Yeah. Absolutely. I, you know, I take full responsibility for it. And, but it turned ugly. Yeah. He went on this bashing rage online and he sent bots out to all of my podcast reviews and, and Facebook. I mean, it was nasty. And so I realized how important brand reputation was at that point because when he went out and started to did that public bashing, I had to address it. And one of the things Russell always taught me was you have to address it head on. Yes. Get in front of it, as I say. Yeah. Yep. Great. Get in front of it. Don't let it spiral out because it could cost you your career. Yeah. And so I went out, I just made a statement, posted it, and then I didn't visit social media for the rest of the day. I just right. let it go. And I revisited it later on in the, after, uh, later on in the evening, and it, it almost brought me to tears. Yeah. What happened was my community went to bat for me Brilliant. and completely destroyed all of that negativity. Shut just shut it down. Yeah. And I looked at my wife and my wife looked at me and, and she said, you know, look at what you have created. Yeah. It's and a, it's, I it's said, movement, isn't it really? It, it, it's, like, it's more than a, a community. It's a movement that is. Yeah. And so I, but here's what happened, Mike. Yeah. It, if, it effed me up mentally for about four months. Right. Because the things that were said, you know, you start you to question. Know. You start to question yourself, and imposter syndrome comes in. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to lie. It was a slow time of year. Around the holidays, it kind of slows down a yeah, little bit. January, it becomes a kind of a slow month, right? So it was bad timing. And yeah. so first of the year comes, and it was crickets. And I went about, I don't know, close to 90 days with no, no – income coming in substantial enough to really like even cover the bells. Right. Yeah. And things started to dwindle again. Right. And I was going through a big transition personally, becoming a father for the first time. Yeah. So there were some things there that were, you know, tripping me up. And so I went out and I made some really stupid financial per like purchases oh. and just dug my hole. And I, here I am again, bank account strangling, and now I have a family. So I said, I need to get my act together. So I had a, I had a heart to heart with my father, and he really, he said this one thing, and I, I, I apologize in advance if I get a little choked up, but he, yeah, said, that's fine. he said to me, he said, you got a son now, dude. And he said, what are you going to do when he comes to you one day and asks you for something? Yeah. Are you going to say that you don't have money? That <laughs> he said, I worked four effing jobs. Yeah. To make to it for you. you. He said, I didn't do that to you. No. And that was it, dude. It's like, wow. I, mean, I, I could have I, that, that's like a real wake up call, isn't it? And, and, and there's no fluff around that. That's straight through the heart. <laughs> and so he, he was kind enough to, you know, lend me some money to get back on my feet. Yeah. And, and I said, let's, let, uh, you know, let's roll. And yeah, well, let's get to work. <laughs> yeah. So let's go to work. So <laughs> one thing I did not do is I didn't, I, I, I sort of weaned out a lot of the coaches and consultants that I had around me. Yeah. And I, I focused in on two specific ones. And then I actually narrowed it down to just one. Yep. And with that help, I never, never stopped investing in that. I didn't. Yeah. Right. And so I continued to, and then every time I would talk to my mentor, I would five X my, my return yeah. every yeah. freaking time. Yeah. And so I said, here we go. Getting back up, getting back up. Within two months, Mike, there's a quarter of a million dollars sitting in the bank. Brilliant. 60 days. 60 days. It's like a life-changing oh, game. It's a break. massive move. Massive move. 
And so here's what that taught me. Every time I was going through that funk and it really started to eat at me, I said, this is temporary. <laughs> I will get out of this. Yeah. I've done this before. Oh, I can do it again. I will do it again. Yeah. And I kept telling myself that, telling myself that. And then with the help of Chris and then with the help of, with Tom. And now it's just like, I keep sending them big wins. Absolutely. And they are just continuing to cheerlead me on. And now here's what happened. With all that money in the bank, I have runway. Yeah, you've got it. I, Bandwidth, as I call it. Yeah, you've got yeah, business bandwidth. I have runway. I have a choice whether to take on a new client or not. Yeah. The other thing that I want to mention was all of those big hefty purchases that I made, <sighs> I got rid of them. Yeah. I returned them. And one of the things that it, I learned there was it didn't sting as bad as I thought no. giving them back. Yeah. In fact, sometimes it's relief, isn't it? It was a huge relief. And now I don't have to break this huge nut every month. Yeah. And it's just now I can invest that money in back into the brand, back into exposure, back into awareness. You know, I was paying two grand for a car per month. What? Like now I've sink that two grand back into the business and it's gotten me here on the show with you today. Like, I love <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's because I've, I've invested in exposure. And if you, yeah. if I wasn't doing that, you wouldn't have never, I would have come across you. Absolutely. Yeah. So the more exposure and you get to a newer audience and it just cycles and cycles and cycles. And, and so that is my, that is a huge, huge uh, lesson learned this year. And oh, wow. now I'm on a track to do more than I've ever done last year. And I'm only working with six, seven people. Yeah. And when I did the math last year, um, I worked with 40. Yeah. And you so, get spread too thin, don't you, with that? And you, your best work doesn't come out. Let me tell you something. I made a conscious decision that I will only work with 10 clients at any given time. Yeah. Th and that is my cap. And that, that's not some scarcity play. Oh, that yeah. is level of quality. And I know that that's what me and my team can handle at a really high level. That's it. The maximum okay. output and, and the clients get the big value. That's it. And so, and it, and it's so helpful because when I, when I'm doing my branding breakthroughs and that's sort of my lead product, yeah. and we'll get into that in a second, you know, I know right away whether that's a win-win yeah. or, or a hell no. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. so, so that's the journey, Mike. I, I, we, we it took us about 40 minutes, but hey, that hey, brings hey. us to today. But honest to God, um, Henry, the, the story and the journey that I try and get out as an entrepreneur myself, I've not had a job since 1994. Um, uh, the paycheck at the end of the month comes out of what I do or not, if that makes sense. Uh, I have a two six figure exits, a seven figure exit. I've even lost a 12 million pound. So about $16 million business uh, in the height of the financial recession in 2012. It cost me a, you know, thicker than half a million pounds, so about $700,000. Um, you know, so I've had the highs, I've had the lows and I sit here and you can probably see I'm just absolutely enthralled because I've, I've walked the miles of hard yards in your shoes. I've had the highs, you know, we. I went out and bought myself in 2005. I've got my chest back out. A brand new Porsche 911 Carrera 2S, 80, 78,000 pounds, about $110,000. I kept it three months and lost 10 grand, so about $15,000. Because I could, you know, so when you say about giving the car back, I understand it. I've been there. And you know what? I couldn't wait to get rid of that 911 Porsche. And people will sit there saying, Mike, you're saying that now. You're crazy. I am telling you what? No. I got it. I had buyer's remorse myself. And they didn't sell me. I bought it. I had buyer's remorse over the car. Uh, it sat in the garage. I did 1,100 miles in three months and gave it back and blew 10,000 pounds sterling. So about fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. And I couldn't wait to get rid of it. But that's, and I know, so I've been there. And, you know, it, it hurts so much. And, you know, you look at your family. My, my kids are a little bit older. You met Jamie's 19. Uh, my daughter's 16. She just got a results from uh, school today. So she's passed her exams. Um, but, you know, not seeing your family, investing those hours. So as a true entrepreneur, I walk. I have walked every single mile with you, Henry. And congratulations for getting out. The secret now is, buddy, is don't do it a third time. You know, 
just, just, yeah, I'm going to keep that cycling stuff. That <laughs> to let, Let's put the cycling on pause and cycle the positivities now and get us on from there. So listen, guys, I know we've extended that journey, but seriously, a lot of our listeners are, you know, C-level decision makers, decision, you know, the CXO, CFO, CAOs, CTOs. Uh, decision makers, they're riding these same journeys. So if you're anything like me, you've been sat here listening to Henry enthralled. And, um, you know, I'm sure Henry would be more than happy to sort of share with you any tips or tricks of how he's, you know, dealt with this. So if you've got any questions, you can either shoot us a message uh, on our preferred Twitter channel using the hashtag the open mic or hashtag growth engine, or you can search um, uh, Henry uh, community or the grand doctor online on Twitter. We'll give you his details at the end of the show, but I'm sure if they've got the questions and you'd be happy to sort of help people uh, not step on the crocodiles, I suppose. And uh, <laughs> I can go from there. My old non-exec used to say to me, Mikey says we're waist deep in crocodiles. Uh, and I said, what? <laughs> If we get neck deep, he says it never gets that far. You die before them. They eat you from the bottom. You know what I mean? But uh, but it is. It's great. And thanks for sharing that journey. Um, if you haven't already buckled up really tight, buckle in because we're going to now move forward into brand and we're going to tap into the awesome experience and knowledge that Henry has. Um, so let's get started, if that makes sense. So when we talk about brand identity, Henry, um, you know, obviously, you know different parts of the world, not just UK, UK, or listeners in Australia, Asia, Russia, things like that. You know, let's just get it onto a plate and get the, you know, the definition right. right. What is it and why is it so important when we talk about brand identity? All right. So I, I hear a lot of brand strategists say this. Let's get it off the table real yeah. quick. Branding is not your logo. It's not your website. It's, it's not your business cards. It's, that's, that's a part of branding. But yes. the branding, what branding truly is, is that gut feeling that people get when they're when they're when they're experiencing you and after they leave your presence yeah. it's what you leave behind it's that gut feeling it's 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 that it's it's really a feeling it's not a necessarily just a look so it's that's branding of, it's not a piece of collateral is it that's what that's saying. correct that's correct but i i break down brand identity into three tiers so yeah. the first tier is how you look and how you show up i was just with robert hershevec from shark tank last yeah. week and he was talking about how, you know, these folks come on the show and it's like they're, they're life breaking, like, like chance, right? Yeah. And they show up on the show and they have no ex Personality. excitement or personality. And they show, <laughs> and, and he's like, here's your chance to shine, dude. And you show up like a wet noodle. Uh, yeah. Like, Crazy. and so it, it's not necessarily, how you look, but how you show up. So that's part, that's part A. Part B is how you make them feel. Yeah. When they, are you inspiring them? Are you, are you making them want to be around you, right? Yeah. Do they want to continue to come back to your brand yeah. and yeah. revisit it, right? And then the third part is the experience. When they come in, what kind of experience are you delivering to them from soup to nuts? And are they are they always being surprised by you or do they know what's coming next and do they feel safe? I think at the end of the day, Mike, we all want to feel safe with our we investments. Do. We don't want to put ourselves at risk. We're risk averse as human beings, aren't we, at the end of the day? And we need to feel comfortable and at ease and trusted. Well, I love what you said about that because what I tell my clients and I've told myself this is what business are we really in yeah. and i'm in the confidence building business so if i can build a brand that they're proud to promote if i can build a, a personal brand inside of that individual that ceo you know or, or or entrepreneur that they walk around with their with their head held high what's that going to do to their revenue and sales Absolutely. process no, right massive impact positive and impact. then and on the flip side of that i'm mitigating risk yeah Team. I'm mitigating risk because they're afraid to move forward because they don't know if I'm the right fit or not. Yeah. So providing all of that branding up front, my sales facilitations are nearly, what do they call that? Like, like, like it's, 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 it's seamless. It's, it really doesn't feel like I'm selling anything. They come ready to go. 
Yeah, so, and it's, it's like the old saying, isn't it? You're not selling anything, you're helping people to buy. You're de-risking it, you're, 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 you're moving that needle for them and you're making it a no-brainer. And I don't know if, and I'm sure you have this, uh, and we maybe cover this later in the podcast or, uh, or we can cover it now, but I get when a, you know, a lot of my clients that come into my private coaching um, uh, programs, what we do in our agency, I take them through a process very much like a, a doctor surgery. So it's consultation, uh, diagnose, prescribe. I don't give them quotes. I give them prescriptions that solve their problems. And then I never get asked to negotiate because it's like, if you've got a headache and I say take two aspirin twice a day, um, you don't say, well, I want to take one at half the strength. You know, you don't argue with the doctor. You take two aspirins twice a day and it delivers the result. And that's how I try to do it. So I find that a lot of our clients will then come to us and say, uh, how do we go ahead? How do we get started? I can't even remember the last time I closed a deal. I, I just can't even remember. It's the customers close themselves type of approach, if that makes sense. And that's not arrogance. It's not ripping people off. It's just understanding the client's need, framing that out, taking them through that journey, refusing to sell them anything, but helping them to buy a solution that makes a difference. And that's it. And the word facil I use the word facilitation yeah. over the word close all the time. I, nobody likes to be closed, <laughs> right? But they want to be, they want to be facilitated. They want to yeah. be led. Yeah. And so that's what we do. No, that's awesome. And that's really, and thanks for providing the clarity around that. So with the ever scaling leverage that companies get from a really correctly, you know, a strong, correctly executed social media strategy, you know, what's the best approach to take? Because now we understand what brand identity is. A lot, I see a lot of people who just put rubbish after rubbish, disconnected stuff onto social. So really in your view to how, you know, with the brand strategy, the brand development, you know, on social, what's the best approach to take Henry? Well, again, I'm going to break this down into three simple steps. Yeah. Okay. People can really digest and understand threes. Yeah. And counts. so that's why I do this very intentionally. So the first step is to really, really understand who your audience is yep. and how your product or service solves their problem. You want to get into the, the challenges and the pains that they're already sifting through their head and you want to come to social media and actually engage in that conversation that they're already having with themselves and their own head. Start, yeah and really start to provide that value because when people see your social media presence they're going to say and it just happened to me on tuesday they're going to say you get me yeah it's almost like you're in my head and I know that you're the guy or you're the gal that's going to take me to where I need to be. Yeah. And that's what happens when you really understand your audience. So that is a huge, huge part. That's first and foremost. And then the next thing you want to do is you want to showcase your expertise. Yes. How many social media gurus out there are trying to pump their service? And then when you go to their Instagram account, they got 40 effing followers. <laughs> What are you going to tell me that I don't already know? Oh, yeah. So, you've, so got to, you've got to practice what you preach there. That's right. And so I'm, you know, we're, we're crushing 68,000. We're, we're just about 68,000 followers on Instagram. That's the platform where you can really, really see me yeah. and, and, and see what I do and how I do it. Very and visual a, brand as well. Very visual channel as well, isn't it? With the, very the, visual challenge channel. So it really works with creatives and, 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 and I just, visuals and stuff. So anyway, so you got to showcase your expertise. So I do a lot of um, behind the scenes looks, you know, I'll be, I'll have a strategy call that I'm recording, yep. which I'll have my video team chop up and 60 second best of moment of that conversation. Yep. We'll put it on my, my Instagram okay. channel. Right. And, and so people can actually see me interacting with my clients and see the value that I'm providing. And then the last thing you want to do is you really want to engage with your audience. Yeah. That is the key performance metric right there. Yeah. When you are engaging, when you're talking with your audience, not at um, your audience, yeah. that's when they're really going to feel part of you. Yes. And that's what builds a really, really great brand and a really great, strong social media campaign and, and, and uh, strategy.
No, that, that, that is three amazing sort of tips there, Harry. And, and I think overall, um, it, it, it's, I'm not saying it's easy either, but it's not that difficult just to take time out to sort of say, hey, what are we trying to achieve here? You know, the audience, we've just got a new business development manager started with us a few weeks ago. And I was just talking exactly about that, about being the authority, being that expert, knowing your audience. Uh, Haley's um, specializing in health and beauty and fitness. She comes from that sort of niche and, and sector. Um, and we're trying to build and we say, you know, nobody's doing that in the UK. Nobody's really bossing that health and fitness market. So let's get out there. Let's boss LinkedIn with it. Let's get you out on the whiteboards. Let's get you out on the podcast. Let's, you know, let's make you that expert in that field because, you know, it's such a vertical that is untapped. Um, you know, we, you can make quick wins and, and I don't mean ripping people off, but quick strides to establish authority, give value out, value, 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 value. And yeah, when it comes down to making a deal or getting awareness, you know, you feel more confident in yourself to ask for that business because you're more entitled. You know, you've given a lot of value out there. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a commercial enterprise at the end of the day. And, you know, there's a great saying that uh, I think Steve Wozniak said, which was, you know, um, I think it goes something along the lines of that information should be free but my time is chargeable um, or something like that and, and, and you know I, I still give a lot of my time to my charities and things like that but ultimately I'll give as much information and a lot of people message me and say Mike you know we're giving a lot of stuff away why don't you charge us because it's out there if, if they want to go and take it if I help somebody great if the one of them come and engages then they can buy into that more insular uh, environment and they're going to get a lot more value inside the curtain than they are outside the curtain but I'm a big believer in that so that's some great advice and uh, quick quick slightly off script Henry, but on Instagram uh, what's your prediction for it obviously the change in it with the sponsored links and things like that Honestly, we're just getting started over there. Yeah. I think it's going to be, they're really, I don't know about the whole IGTV thing. I didn't yeah. really buy into it. Um, I, I'm not a huge uh, fan of it, to be honest with you. Yeah. I think the Instagram story platform is really going to explode yeah. and it, it's going to evolve. And I'm heavily doing a lot of Instagram story work. Um, the swipe up feature is amazing. It really can help, you know, get other folks into your pipeline, into your yeah. funnels. And so, uh, I feel like Instagram is just going to dominate yeah. the, the, the other social platforms in the near future. I agree. I agree. It's something that uh, is, is, if you're not on Instagram or you're not getting started with Instagram, you need to get on it. And, and you know, and obviously if your audience is there, of course, but you, you know, and, and do your research, as Henry says, but it is a platform that's going to move uh, for sure. Um, so that's great. And with brand strategy, the significant advantages, including, you know, what we call getting paid your worth. Um, you know, can you cover this in more detail and how companies can really leverage brand and their return on investments? Yeah. So a lot of folks get ask me, you know, how much is, is this cost? How much does that cost? And my question, my, always, my answer is always, it's, it depends. Yeah. And so what I'd like to do is I like to just on a super high level, real quick, talk about value-based selling. Yep. So, you know, you're not going to, if, if GE, General Electric corporate comes to you and, and is looking for, you know, consulting, you're going to charge them the same amount of money that you would charge Joe Smith, you know, mom and pop shop in town? Yeah. No, because there's a huge difference in risk. So GE has a hell of a lot more to lose than Joe sure. Smith's little consulting shop in town. I'll give you a quick yeah. example. Um, back in the day, Pepsi, PepsiCo, yeah. uh, paid Arnell design firm $1 million dollars to rebrand, just re, re, redo the Pepsi logo, not even create it from scratch. Paid a million dollars, right? Why? When not too long ago, Phil Knight hired Catherine, I forget her last name, $30 to do the Nike logo. Yeah. Right? So, which is about 200 bucks today, right? So there's a huge gap between 200 bucks and a million, right? Here's what happened. So PepsiCo hires the same company to redo the Tropicana orange juice box. Yeah. What happened was critical. Within 60 days, PepsiCo lost $30 million wow. because they changed. So that was an epic fail. Yeah. So they quickly reverted back to the old look. Yeah. They were willing to spend a million to avoid losing 30 million. Yeah. 
Okay. So there's a huge, so that's, so that's value-based selling. So when I ask people, how much is a client worth to you? And they say $800, $1,000, $10,000. I'm saying, well, what are you willing to invest in order to acquire that client? Yep. And if they say a hundred dollars, you can't make major moves with minor effort. You can't. You can't. Jim Rohn says that as well. I don't even know. That's right. Jim Rohn, That's right. majors and minors. Yeah. That's right. So it's not going. It, it's not going to work because your competition is going to be able to spend more to acquire that that market Absolutely. share, and they're going to beat you. So yeah. what are you willing to? So when I start to look at the value in what I do, you st well, in, in in I should say, in our listeners, when you start to look at the value that you deliver that will help this client or prospect get to where they want it to be, yeah. which is called your future desired state. Yeah. Yeah. When you, when you start to uncover that, that's when you start to pull out the real value. See, people buy what they want, not what they need. People sure. need shoes, but they want the Yeezys. They want yeah. the Gucci's. <laughs> you know, people buy, need cars, but they want the Range Rovers and the Bentleys you have to give them what they want, but they don't know what they want yet. So yeah. you have to uncover that. And we do that in a very thorough diagnosis, which is called the branding breakthrough. Yeah. And that is my lead product. So before I even onboard a client yeah. to the next level, we go through a branding breakthrough. We give them the clarity. We give them the focus. We start asking them questions that they've never thought of in their life before. Yeah. And, and it starts to churn them over and really, really, really get them to think. That's it. So that's, that, that's how you start to get paid your worth. Brilliant. No, that's great. And just as another one, I don't know if you've seen the Shell uh, oil company example of, again, I think it was about 1970 or 71. They brought a branding consultant. I think it was a half a million dollar fee then in the early 70s uh, to change the Shell logo. And, the, and they took the money and I, I think they didn't mind the things, but they said, hey, leave it as it is because you'll lose more if you if you change the Shell uh, oil company you know logo than if you keep it. And uh, I share that story you know quite regular. And if you've got it, and if anybody of the listeners want to go to Google, just put shell brand over the years in and then look at images on Google and it brings up like a little eight logo since 1908 1908 or something like that and they're all shell and sometimes they put shell at the bottom sometimes they haven't but they've kept the core all the way through and little little subtle tweaks but they've kept it the same because the value of that brand is there and uh, I just wanted to share that with the listeners because I buy totally into the Nike logo uh, I hadn't heard the Pepsi one so I've learned that uh, and thank you for sharing that one but uh, it, it is amazing and you know I think it's also uh, about understanding your worth, as like you said as well. That branding breakthrough workshop—it it sounds awesome. Do you want to just share a little bit more what you're doing? That uh, would you be happy to do that, uh, Henry? Yeah, about, so the, you know, the, the, I know you say you, you sort of ask them questions, but you know, is there like two or three stages that get them to sort of flip and the, and the penny drops? Or it's simply an introductory console call, yeah. you know, at its at its at its finest. Yeah. Um, what I like to do, people ask me, so I'm going to, I'm going to pay you a hundred, two hundred dollars. Well, I'm going to raise the price today. Nobody knows yeah. that. <laughs> You're the first to know, Mike, the price is getting raised today. Um, you know, I'm going to pay you to talk to me for 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And at the end, I'm, we may not even move forward. And I say, well, yeah, because my time is worth something. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, I need to weed out the people that aren't serious about putting in the hard work to build their brand and grow their business. Absolutely. And so it is a true consultative call. So just like you do, yep. and just like you know, doctors work with their patients, it's about a 45 minute to an hour call, and it is a thorough diagnosis. Yep. We probably, I probably ask about 15 questions, 20 yep. questions. That's a lot in that time. It's a lot. And they and and by the time we are about to part on that call the client knows a lot about their business and brand and themselves yep. that they never ever thought of and so the they can take that away can't they and they could even use that with another agency if that's what they wanted to perhaps, do perhaps perhaps but i can tell you right now about 90% of them will sign up yeah, because they realized that like, holy crap. All right, I paid $200 for this call. I got about $2,000 worth of value. So yeah. what if I pay him 10? What is that? What is the ROI on, on that investment going to look like? And so that, so I, I, I call it the branding breakthrough because that's exactly what it is. These folks are breaking through and finding the clarity that they need to really move the needle forward because 
I get a lot of self-diagnosed folks coming to me. I need a new logo. I need a new website. Well, why do you think you need yeah, that? Back up a couple of yards, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that's great. And thanks for sharing that. So if you're sat at home and, you, you know, and you're listening to this in your car, you're watching it on YouTube, and you're thinking, I can't charge people for my time, you know, get your value proposition right. What Henry's talking about here is he's not just going to take a call with no structure. You know, he's, he's experienced gone into this. Um, he's, he's got structured questions that he knows what's going to move the needle. And if you're confident in your product and your product, you know, and you know, you know, like what the, the DM guys do, the before and after sort of shift, you know, you lift down, here's, in, here's the, the flux. What do I have? What am I about? What's my status? What's my average day look like? If they're really sad or, or you know, they're not achieving their goals. And then if they buy and come consume your product or service, you can move that needle, um, then why would you go out there? Henry, as an example, you know, I don't go and see clients unless they pay me to go and see them. Um, they'll say to me, hey, Mike, will you come and see me for an opportunity? No. You know, I'll, I'll do it. Like I say, I'll do an initial, we, we do an initial 15 minute, what we call fit call. And this is more like a HubSpot environment, a HubSpot agency thing. 15 minutes, just fit. Now that is free, that 15 minutes. But what we're looking for is, are these, are these nice people because we work in partnership? Do they have a problem that we can solve? And are they looking to hire an external company to solve it? But after that, then it's a paid, it's a paid gig all the way from qualification to meetings to whatever it would be. And then we give them a document, a strategic document that says, hey, even if you don't want to work with us, you could take that and give it to another agency, but they've paid for that expertise and advice. And each stage is a shortlisting process. So I'm with it all the way. And, you know, and, and I know maybe if you're a bricks and mortar shop front, you can't always do that. But ultimately, especially in consultancy or professional services, value your time. Listen to what Henry's saying, because, you know, your bottom line will improve. And all the people who refuse to pay are probably not even going to be the right customers anyway, or are going to be the pain in the butts that we talked about earlier that go on, you know, uh, online rampages or whatever it might be. So that's great advice um, on that, uh, Henry. Thanks again for that. So it wouldn't be a branding exercise without sort of prioritizing your goals and getting that, that, how essential is that? So maybe you could share about, you know, when you're getting your brand identity, the importance of prioritizing or, or identifying those goals, prioritizing them and then executing on them. Excellent. Some, uh, yeah. It was on that place. Yeah. So basically what I do is it's an exercise where I look at the desirability of the goal, the doability of the goal. Yeah. And we will look at it, whether it be, and we actually rate it, right? And then based on that rating, we look at, is that a small, is that a short-term goal, medium-term goal, yep. long-term goal? And what I like to focus my clients on are revenue generating goals. Yep. So there may be a particular priority of creating a sales process, creating a sales training. The worst thing that I see my clients do is focus on trying to generate leads, but they don't have a process to actually convert the lead. Just so you're going to, yeah, you're going to, you're going to file all these people into a funnel and then get them on the phone and not know what to do with them. Yeah. Crazy. So it doesn't make sense. So we want to make sure that we provide a very strategic and intentional course of action after we go through the deep diagnosis and discovery phase. Yeah. So that's how we create our prioritization is by looking at is this going to move the needle in regards to profits and revenue? And if yep. not, we, it's probably not that important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with the revenue goals, everything that we do um, with a plan, I don't know if you've seen it done this way in the, in the States, but I know it's done sort of maybe a UK thing, Henry, I don't know. But when we, when we map out the strategy, what I'll do, I'll get, I'll get a number of these highlighter pens um, and I'll get a red and a green one. Uh, and I'll draw around the strategy, green, which contribute to the revenue and the growth of the company. And I'll draw around the piece of the strategy, which are cost or investment. Now, even though it's red, it doesn't necessarily mean to say it's a negative cost, you know, it, you know, but it's an essential investment. But I'll draw it and then I'll look at the paper and I'll think how much red and how much green have I got on here? And how much neutral, which may be just sucking time that is not really priority. And the simple RAG, red, amber, green, with these little sort of dollar pens, how, you know, by, if we implement this strategy, how much is going to boost the revenue? How much is going to suck the time or how much is it going to cost us to get there and we can forecast it in all the financial forecasters we can get the roi we can get the finance directors out but do you know what just getting a red amber green by drawing it out and we're looking at taking a new office in in like the, the there's like a, a place in doncaster called lakeside and it's a really popular urban area and the rent's fairly high uh, in in those areas as you'd expect 
So we've drawn all the floor plan out and I've done exactly the same. Every room I put, is that an earning room or is that a cost room? And like the new podcast room that we get in, that's going to be an earning room because it's brand awareness and things like that. And the sales presentation room, a bit like Nespresso doing their model. Uh, and I'm even mapping that out with red, amber, green. So again, whether you've done that, whether you've come across it, it's a slightly different play. I don't know if I even invented that. I don't know, but it works for me that I can just look at it visually and say, that's a money earner or that's a time suck or that's going to be a cost that we need a budget for. So um, that's just some ideas that I just want to share with you back over the pond. Uh, I don't know if that works for you, but if it doesn't, you know, go from there, but it works for me. I love it. I love it. Just a great way of getting a visual on it. Yeah. Awesome. So um, when we're talking about brands, um, the client and the engagement, what is the importance of the customer journey, Henry, and how does it play out and why is it needed? Well, again, when, when you really understand your customer better than they understand themselves, they see you as a thought leader. They look at you as a subject matter expert. And so you really need to spend some time and really understand what their journey is. So every customer has a potential journey that they have gone through in order to get to you. Yeah. Okay. So the, one thing that I, yeah, so the one thing I want you to look at is you got to ask these questions. How did they find you? How did they find you? Yeah. right? Is it through a Facebook ad? Is it through an Instagram ad? Is it from a, a referral partner? How did they find you? And whatever's working, you want to triple and quadruple down on that. The next thing you want to ask is, why did they engage with you in the first place? Yeah. What pain, right? Tony Robbins talks about people buy for two reasons, avoid ple uh, gain pleasure, avoid pain. Yeah. I would like to say, let's just get rid of uh, 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 gain pleasure because yeah, that's true, but more people are going to move based on the fear of getting burnt. Yeah. And so I like to just say, people are gonna take action because they've gotten to a breaking point. Yeah. And the pain is just too deep. So you have to find what that is. Yeah. And, you, and that's going to help you understand how, why they're engaging with you. The next thing you wanna ask yourself is, why are they coming back? Yeah. Are you giving them a reason to come back? Yeah. Okay, are you, do you have a follow-up sequence? you know, over the next 90 days, right? That is going to offer them more value, yeah. right? Not and then the last, that's correct. And then the last thing I want you to think about is what are the values and beliefs in these folks behind their decision making? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, with all, when, and, and when you answer those questions and you can understand that journey, you're going to be able to put the right message in front of the right people. And you guys know what happens after that. Yeah. It, it's just boom. It's, it, it's there. And I go back to, um, I bought uh, a course from Dan Kennedy at GKIC, uh, magnetic marketing. I think I bought it in, uh, 1997 or six. So it, and that's when I got a folder and it got shipped from the States. It took six weeks to get here. And it was just like photocopied paper inside with a couple of deep, well, there were CDs that I don't think they were a DVD invented. Uh, but magnetic marketing, it was just like, whoa, that I got the concept. This is like, if you've got to date this, this is like, 12, what, the date of this recording, guys, is August 2018. So I'm talking 1995, 1996. So it's like 22, 23 years ago. And I still have magnetic marketed on my shelf and a, and a full rack of Dan Kennedy stuff there. And what he's got, he's got a triangle in this photocopy thing, Henry. And, it, and the top, it, it, it says market. And then the, the second corner says me, uh, message. And then the third one says medium. And I always remember that. Find your market. Get the right message to them at the right point, And then worry about the collateral for the medium. And like you say, what happens then? You can get that to click. It's just like dialing that last combination lock in on there. You know, you may have three dialed in then. It just won't open. But once you get that last one, boom, it just goes, doesn't it? So... It's great advice. It really, really is. And uh, I'll have to actually remind him, I'll have to get magnetic marketing out and just have another readout of nostalgia because there's value in it every single time. So if you, if you don't have that, guys, and you're seriously interested in marketing, uh, go over to gkic.com um, and check out magnetic marketing. There's also an advanced magnetic marketing plus a whole other raft of resources that Dan Kennedy and Bill Glazer do over there. So that's pretty awesome as well. Um, so that's awesome on, on, on the customer journey, Henry. Uh, you know, I'm... I, I, it goes without saying, I think your story is amazing. The journey, the, 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 you know, the, the determination is fantastic. You're, you're an absolute legend. And thank you very much for being on the show. I sincerely appreciate you sharing your experiences. And, you know, 
even for the best of us or you or whatever it is, we all have highs, we all have lows, but it's about that determination to keep going, going, going. Um, so thanks for adding so much value today, Henry. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure to learn from you and share some similar stories. And, and also it puts me at ease because some of the mistakes you're making, I'm making, uh, still making, and you know, you think you know, we're not perfect, we learn every day. So um, as we sort of wrap up on this episode, uh, we've covered so much uh, and there's so much value. Um, if you want to learn more about Henry, you can go over to uniquedesigns.net and that's unique, U-N-I-Q-U-E-D-E-S-I-G-N-Z.net. So uniquedesigns.net. Um, you can find um, uh, Henry on Facebook at uh, facebook.com forward slash Henry Kaminsky, J R for junior. Uh, and what's your, what's your Instagram uh, uh, handle there as well, uh, Henry? It's the brand DR. Yeah, so the brand DR being the brand doctor. Uh, go and check Henry out there. Make sure you follow there and, and subscribe to the awesome stuff he's putting out there. And uh, so before we wrap on the show, Henry, uh, could you sort of summarize? And I know it's, it's like an impossible question because you've given us so much value today. But about the brand identity, the brand strategy, if you were to sort of give the listeners sort of three tips or three pro tips to really double down on, what would they be? Okay, so find your high income skill. And I got that from Dan Locke. I, I want to give credit where credit's due. Yeah. You know, find a high income skill set yeah. and triple down on it, right? Yeah. The next thing you want to do is showcase your expertise. Yeah. You want to show them that you're a thought leader and expert in what it is that you do. And then last but not least, don't take shit from anyone. <laughs> And the latter one being the most important. I mean, <laughs> distract you. Listen, Henry, thanks ever so again. So again, guys, if you want to go over to Instagram, at brand, at the, it's the brand DR or just brand DR. It's the brand DR. The, the brand DR. Uh, Henry Kaminsky Jr. on Facebook or Unique Designs with a Z at the end. We'll put the links on the, the podcast as we put those out and we'll put them on there. If you want to shoot Henry a question, um, again, you can get that to us via the hashtag the open mic or hashtag growth engine or alternatively just send Henry a message. I'm sure he'll be more than happy to help you guys out and help you avoid some of those crocodile pits that it sounds like both me and Henry's lost his legs on over the years. Um, so thanks again for being on the show, Henry. You've been an absolute pleasure oh thanks for having me mike it's an absolute pleasure so as always as entrepreneurs you know, you're finding your journey you're on the path you've got to get in the game you've got to go do the hustle you've got to go make it happen it's mike Mitchell signing off on this open mic podcast and we'll catch up with you in next week's show thanks again henry you got it you have been listening to the open mic brought to you by the success hub to find out more and to get the resources we have mentioned in this podcast episode, simply visit blog.thesuccesshub.io and view the podcast section. Thanks for listening and we look forward to catching up with you in our next episode. This podcast and associated materials is published under copyright to The Success Hub. All rights reserved. No reproduction of this material is permitted.